want to, if I don't put code on production on Friday, then why do the, I put this code on Thursday or on Wednesday? Maybe I shouldn't code at all, because I accept that I am that bad. No, I want to be better. So, and there are a lot of ways you can be better, and you know of them. One way to be better is to be disciplined, to look at each line of code you do, and all your colleagues. This have you ever tried to be very careful at your work? Who has tried this? Uh, some of you. Does it work? Does it work eight hours a day, five days a week, for 20 years in a team of 20 people or whatever? Nope. It's just not the way. And it's, even if you think that's the way, it's incredibly tedious. It's boring. It's no fun. So maybe there's other way. There is. You write a lot of tests. Who writes a lot of tests? Seriously? I've been to your projects. You, are, you never have enough tests. So, OK, and there is a third way. It's obviously, it's great to have many tests. I write many tests. I try to do as much as possible. Whenever it happens a bug, I write another test. And then there is a third way. Do a functional programming. And promise is, if you do functional programming, you will have a little bit less error, maybe more, uh, way more, less errors. We'll see. Uh, and you will even write less code. And obviously, less code is, again, less error. So more, more or less, it's the same. But OK, it means that you can express yourself better. And you don't have, in order to have the same quality, you will not have to write that many tests. So your test will be more uh, coupled and more tied to business logic, not to the uh, infrastructure stuff, for instance. But big misunderstanding that happens sometimes is some people say, oh, those guys are writing a project on Haskell, and they had just a terrible bug on production. You know why it's a lie? What obviously is a lie. First thing, Haskell on production, come on. That never happens. And second is, obviously, yeah, th there is nothing wrong. Everyone can do a code. Everyone can do a mistake, even in Haskell. But those errors are typically less severe and happen in a way that this is way easier to spot them. I will show you. OK. Nevertheless, my goal in life is like this. I put, I make the push to master. OK, that was a pull request merge. And then I go to the airport. It is two hours from my home to, I don't know, Mediterranean, some beach somewhere. That's how I would like my weekends to be two hours after deployment. OK. So, so if, we, if we discuss that, so what's even this functional programming? So simple thing is there are many, multiple definitions. Who, thinks that, who of you thinks that you are doing functional programming? Who is a functional developer? One, two, three. Come on, oh, more people. Five. So we have a couple of them. So the point here is. There are many definitions. One that I like is this, programming with mathematical function, functions that are deterministic, total, pure. And this de the definition I stole from John DeGos, who is kind of I got a guy I follow from a Scala community. He has always great statements on Twitter. I, I love this. His simple view and opinion on many things. Ah, OK, so deterministic, it's simple. Function depends on only on arguments, and arguments yield the same results for the uh, and, and we the same results for the same arguments, obviously. So who thinks the third function, radom, uh, that's uh, not a spelling mistake, I just love the city. Who thinks this is a, a deterministic function? Raise your hand. No hands? Uh, that's not, really, because it's using random. Probably it's not. OK. The rest of them, they are purely deterministic, even function without arguments. So if in functional programming, if we have function without an argument, then obviously it must be a constant because it depends on nothing. OK. Total, this is something simple, and I won't cover this uh, topic much today, but in school you've learned that function gives you result for all the objects in the domain. So all of them. So for instance, if you look at the parse int, 
It is from string to int. I have on person, person not given a code here. Who thinks this is a total function? Always gives the result. Who thinks it's not? Okay, I will tell you it depends, but obviously it's wrong because there are some strings like blah blah. Which int you give for that? You either give uh, give an exception, which means exceptions is not is not a valid result. It's something we don't do in functional programming. In functional programming, exception means this is the end of the world. I just give up. I end of the program. I do it. So some, in, in a functional code, you will see exceptions used, but not. Uh, do you, you will basically not see them being caught because if there is exception, it means panic. Database is not working. I am just started to format disk. I have just started to format disk, but that was my, not my idea, so I better uh, give uh, give up and end program. You don't catch and do something else. If you catch, then there is an other way in functional programming. But I will not cover this today. But basically, other way would be parsing blah blah is zero. Then it would be actually total function. But it would be stupid. Okay. And pure, this is the most complex uh, uh, idea to discuss. I present a pure, it means does, does not leave traces. It, it doesn't do side effects. And the way how I describe this is based on something called referential transparency. Look at this code. You have this method add, which does A plus B. And then you have some place which you, pu you can put code A. That's Whatever code you can put here, and some place you can put code B, and in the middle you have either. Let's imagine for a moment that you don't control this code in the middle. Someone writes it's, for instance, hidden in other function, and someone there, either maybe he calls add function, so he just calls it, or just puts a result. The question is, can you put something in code A and code B to find out if this function was really called? And do you think you can write this code that will find out if that was a real function call or just was a value assigned? Can you write this code? Who has idea? OK, if you are a real hacker, it's possible. Maybe I'll just find the source on the disk. Yeah? But I, uh, the idea is, if you stay on the same level of abstraction that as the rest of the code, it shouldn't be easily that, uh, possible to detect what, if it was called or just value was assigned. And so obviously, there are three functions. And for, for instance, function uh, uh, first is obviously, let's say, stupid, but it's pure. Function two, you can detect, because you can put thread mm, system current time millis before and after, and you can check uh, that, the, that the function was really called or it just was result given. Yeah? And the function three is actually a complex story, because is debugging, is putting diagnostic log, uh, impure thing. Who thinks it's pure? Who, who thinks putting diagnostic log mean, makes the function still pure? Yes, In my, because I said before, given the same level of abstraction as the rest of the code. So typically in our code, we write something to logs, but we don't read them, we don't analyze them. This is, I'm, I'm talking about diagnostic log for developers, not the business log. So, because you never read it, you, can, you normally never actually find out if something was really added to the log. You cannot, I can say, if you don't hack, you will not detect that. So because of that, I consider this as, let's say, strictly it's not pure, but practically we can consider it pure. OK. The question is, what is a killer feature of functional programming? Who has idea why it's so cool? So one simple thing, composability. That if you stick to those rules before, you compose your program, all of these functions, OK, methods, doesn't matter. I call them functions for simplicity. And the promise is that basically this will never break for some technical errors, like null pointer, exception, unexpected. It, it, if it compiles, it would work more or less as you've written that. Obviously, this is it. OK. So, and that's the problem, actually, in imperative programming, because you sometimes add something to one code here, and for some strange, mysterious reason, code that is 100 classes away breaks. Then you find out there is actually, uh, this, that's typically no mystery. There are really reasons for that. But those are surprises. In functional programming, we have less such surprises. OK, and now the second part, Kotlin propaganda. I, am, I was, for a couple of years, Kotlin developer. I'm still doing Kotlin. So 
What is a Kotlin killer feature? Who is writing Kotlin right, right now? OK, great. This is a great language. Is it Java++ or Scala minus minus? Who? Minus minus. Who thinks it is Java++? Who thinks it is Scala minus minus? OK. <laughs> so I more think, it, uh, think of it as Scala minus minus, actually. OK. So if you look at the typical Java developer keyboard, what do you see there? There is one key really heavily used. OK. I didn't cover the uh, Control C, Control V story, but that's the Control V story, but that's the other. But you know, semicolon. Yeah? So Kotlin, no more semicolon, semicolon. So awesome! You should switch to Kotlin right now, because you will save your keyboard. Obviously. But there, is, uh, there are other uh, nice features in Kotlin like this. Data classes. Who thinks those are awesome? Yeah. Do we have something like that in Java? What? No. I will show you why. <laughs> OK? Uh, it's close, but as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, it's not yet there. So this is an old-style Java that represents that data class before with three parameters. Oh, actually, no. Because there was this uh, optional constructor parameter if a person is drinking, and by default it's true. But we can do that in Java, in old style Java, with just giving another constructor. So it's, it's possible. But then we realized, OK, equals and hash code, and obviously records in Java have that. So it is given. And to string, cool. But there is still one thing important. So let's go back to Kotlin and write this code p person irec, like typical Polish name. But we see a mistake. We should change it to the capital letter up front. But this is immutable. We can't change. But we can create another object with a, a, a corrected name. Can you do that easily in Java records right now? As far as I know, not yet. I know there was a discussion about but it's not yet there. But the point is we'll have two objects right now, one corrected. And if we never mutate objects, the, it means we don't have surprises in code. And the point is, because it's so easy to mutate in the many ways in Kotlin, you use immutability way more. You actually use it all the way because the language doesn't make you problem with that. It makes you actually very easy to use immutable records, thanks to the copy. By the way, Scala has exactly the same thing, so Kotlin actually copied this. And obviously, we can do that in Java. Uh, uh, putting copy methods, but that will be a uh, couple of them. You can count how many, all the combinations. So it doesn't really fit the screen, but if I make font smaller, uh, almost smaller, and with 30 semicolons, it's still not enough, yeah? And with this kind of font, the Kotlin would look like this. But nevertheless, we go back to this point, and now think that those were three attributes used. What if there are seven? How many copy methods you would have to generate in Java? For that, who knows? No. <laughs> May okay, that's a good, good. Actually, maybe you're right. Seven, seven factorial. I'm not sure. It's a good, 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 I, good, good thing. I thought that 127, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Interesting. I will, I will, I will think about later. But nevertheless, so records are almost there, but do not cover the critical for me part making it easy to use immutable records. Simple. And that's a Kotlin thing. And once you switch from Java to Kotlin, you will see how useful is that. Yeah? So now we'll go to the pure code rules. What I mean by pure code? It's not a clean code. It's pure code. It's orthogonal. Unfortunately, in Polish, we don't have a difference between czysty and czysty. Pure, OK. So it's like hard to talk this in Polish. So the most important rule is like do not mutate. Yeah? So we have immutable records, but we need also other things. Immutable lists, hash maps, trees, whatever, data structures. Do you have them in Java? Yes. What do you use? OK. Uh, in Java? OK, maybe, in, uh, maybe there is something in, in new in Java. For years, I was using this, Waver. Who was using Waver? OK. Uh, so even while I was still Java developer, mostly, and Later, in my recent Java projects, I was basically using Wave all the way. Those are my list, immutable list. Those are great. And, and interesting, I still use them in Kotlin. I will tell you why. So this is how Wave list looks in Kotlin. 
you have list one, two, three. You add one object in front. And actually, you have two lists independently. You have never mutated. And if you think it's very inefficient, because what if I have a million objects in the first list? The cost of this operation will be the same as adding to the list of three. Constant, very small. It's different if you will be adding at the end, but that's actually, if you have functional list immutable, you have to know how to use them. They will be always safe, but in order to use them efficiently, you will have to learn a little bit, not much. So for instance, prepending, not appending. But uh, by the way, there is something called vector, where, where it's effectively constant or adding, modifying, whatever. So it's actually not that you are very constrained. It's just the simple list is like that. And Kotlin, so many people are actually asking, now, even in my team, why in Kotlin you are using Vavr, where in Kotlin there is built-in immutable list? Mm. Unfortunately, it's not that great, uh, great as uh, Vavr, because first, it's not that efficient. And second, because it's only view on a mutable list, there are scenarios, real-life scenarios, where you can actually can modify this list accidentally. And you will have, especially in Kotlin, that will be a great surprise. Now, if you call, for instance, Java. And obviously, there is a Java array list. I, for years, I don't know, since 2015, I was just not using Java Util at all, for many reasons, because I don't say this is all bad package. It's package for low-level operations on, um, I would say, utilities like list optionals, whatever. But it's not a good package for a business code. For a business code, you should use Vavr, Guava, Immutables, the different uh, libraries, even in Java. Like, OK. So basically like this. Next step, type inference. This is something that's also right now in Java, and there are many discussions on Twitter. Is var a good thing or not? Because a lot of people think, people say that actually var is bad because you don't see a type, so it's not safe. Yeah? First, in Kotlin, we actually have var and val. And obviously, only one of them is good because if you create a variable and then you change it because var lets you do that, first thing is why don't you create, why can't you create the correct value first? I always, uh, I am the cider person. I know what I want, so I create vals with a correct value, and I don't change it, because I never have to. So the use of that is the same as in Java. You just don't have to put this string. It's obvious. Compiler knows it. Now the question is, is it? Yeah. So um, a little bit more. In Kotlin, however, you can use it everywhere for fields, for constructor fields. So basically, constructor field is something that is Argument of constructor and instantly a field. So a shortcut that you don't copy in constructor your arguments. Really syntax sugar that I like in Kotlin. The point is of this picture here is that Kotlin, and most of people will agree with that, is way more sophisticated, way more powerful language than Java. So with less code, you can express more. But actually, if you look at the syntax, it's simpler. It has less rule, it's less exceptions. It all follows, for instance, the same structure, val, variable name, and then optional colon uh, and type. You can put that, you don't have to. So the point here is type inference actually means type safety mostly. Why? Like now, metaphor, analogy, OK, at analogy. Passwords policy. Maybe you one day worked with this kind of company. Is it the safe password policy? So one day I worked with this company, kind of. It was, one of those rules was not that strict. It was, wasn't weekly, but monthly. But you know, after a while, I realized that all the people that are consider them safe hey, have passwords under the keyboard on a yellow note. And people that are not that safe have them just on the monitors. Yeah? So let's say this looks initially like less secure. But after all, in practice, it's actually way better policy. Obviously, best is to factor authentication, but this is not about the security talk. So the point, if you look at the hash map, for instance, in Java, what kind of hash map do I mostly see? Hash map of string to string. Or in Kotlin as well, string to string. And the thing is, is it really a string? 
No, it is only a string because programmer was lazy, because you had to put all the time this hash map with something, so you haven't really used the correct type. You made the shortcuts. You just con uh, convert things to strings because key is probably an enum, but you just don't want to don't wanna do that. Or maybe key is even more complex stuff, like it's some uh, wrapper class, whatever. And the value is something more complex. But uh, I put hash maps from strings to string because I don't want to repeat that. So if you have type inference, you can actually have complex type, and you don't have to repeat them. In, in case you want to repeat, you can use type alias. So this is the point. Uh, less writing, more safety in practice. But now the point that is really interesting, expressions. Because if you want, really don't want to use vars, sooner or later you will find out it might be far hard unless you go to expressions. So what I'm talking, if you write the function in the first way, this is Java++ style. I just write a function as in Java, return A plus B. But you can switch instantly. I do recommend this is a big step. OK, this is a small step for a developer, great for a project. So write functions like this, that all your, all your functions are just single expressions. And I will show you how to write even complex code like that on an example. Why? Because first, return is a younger brother of go to. Uh, and second, instructions are just not funny because they are exactly preventing you from writing mathematical functions. So, look at a simple example. OK, you do e commerce orders which are either created, paid, or delivered. So, sealed classes also come to Java. Nothing really that fancy here. And you have a list of these orders. This is your database. Orders. There is a list of, there is one created, one paid, one delivered. OK, actually, two paid, one delivered. And now business comes and says, tell me how much money should we have on account? It means some, all those paid and delivered, but created obviously are not yet paid, so they will be not summed. So if you are old style Java++ developer, you may write impure sum like this with var, with return, with when. When is a switch if you, are, you, know, you don't know uh, Kotlin? Like, is, is it a correct function? Yes, it is. It compiles. Does it c calculate what's needed correctly? Actually, yes. Is it cool? That's not so uncool. I will show you why. I'll show you why. Because you can write first in a pure way, in a, in actually uh, as an expression, and you will use something like fault. And basically, in, function, in functional programming, when you have lists, you constantly fold them. That's it. Like, like the most important operation you have to learn. Folding is just taking some initial zero, for instance, and then having a lambda that says what to do having previous value and the next one. And by the way, here, in order to write it, you actually, I had to cover this created because compiler was complaining. If not, because compiler was, compiler was saying I cannot calculate the next value if I don't have all the cases covered. And that's the trick. Because, you know, one day, Business will come, those are always trolls, and say, I know, I know, uh, as, a, as a business troll, I want to have two additional types of orders. OK? That's typical business story. Cancelled and archived. And archived means uh, it is like uh, mm, was paid and taxes were collected, so money was there. Cancelled, obviously, money was given back. We don't have it. And now the database is a little bit bigger, the base database in, in, you can have in life on a list. And if you look at this impure sum, it still compiles. And now it counts the code, it counts the money incorrectly. It's not watching the archived. And by the way, you, if you enable uh, warnings, you will see a problem in Kotlin. Best if you fail on warnings, which is possible, and I do recommend that, then you actually can have an error here, especially in newer version of Kotlin. But what if you have this impure sum? Actually, here the compiler would, uh, after you, someone, a developer, added these two orders and haven't looked all the code, because that is always stupid. Why should you look all the code when you add something, yeah? Who would think about it? That's, life would be boring if you are doing that. So, but he was a functional programmer, and he knew his whole team is doing functional programming. He, he just added these two new types of orders, and he had a compilation error. It's so cool to have compilation errors, because compiler is just your best friend. 
he will not let you uh, go with uh, sh okay, bad code on the production. Okay, so by the way, if, when, tries are all also expressions on Kotlin, and you, you see it, yeah, if uh, used as an expression. So you actually, thanks to this, you can have complex function written as a single expression. It's so cool. But the thing is, and by the way, just a side note, using uh, object-oriented programming, for instance, using uh, putting a constructor as internal, which is like, say, a fancy way for much better private in okay, in interesting kind of private in Kotlin. I don't cover this. You can have, for instance, this that order must be first paid before delivered. You can't, for, you can't, for instance, create order that wasn't first uh, delivered state that wasn't first paid. Yeah? You can put in your, let's say, domain language that rules. So in this case, object-oriented programming and functional programming uh, in Kotlin greatly work together. Yeah. Nevertheless, we go to other store. Now go to the last, the most crazy step. This is the business scenario. There was a devil delivery. Someone created order, someone paid this order, and then we delivered. Three steps. And business trolls come, and they say we, we need some other stuff, but that will come later. Okay, so. Let's consider for a moment that our delivery is just printing delivered, and that's our, let's say, what really happens. And the business trolls wanted this delivery fast. That's delivery, but fast, express, like other possibility to deliver. At the end, you get the same result, but in a different way, with different side effects, because programming is all about side effects. We actually want to do something at the end. Yeah? So, so we had this original method, and now business trolls say us, if a, order has a value greater than 20, make a fast delivery. So there is this guy who was working six uh, days recently because some other problems uh, he had in other project who, that wasn't functional, and he added mm, this if. If paid income is greater than 20, then deliver fast. And you know, you know he wasn't careful. You obviously see the bug, because it's like five lines of code. But you know, in a real life project, this is, this is potentially in some other method. You don't see that. What happens at the end, we lose money as a company because we deliver the same delivery twice, once fast, once uh, cor correctly. So the uh, customers are obviously happy, but that's not, uh, they are very happy, but that's not the way uh, you do good business. Can you prevent such bugs? Yes, that's a little bit tricky, but Side effects can be done in a pure way. So if you look at this function, it's obviously, let's con for a moment consider all the side effects we do are just prints. So this say it function is an impure function. It prints. But what about this function? Who thinks? So by the way, this means these braces are like in Java. This means it is a lambda. Lambda from unit, from void. It's, so this function creates a function, actually. Who thinks it is pure, this function? Who thinks it's impure? Raise your hands. OK. You are wrong. If you call this say letter, say it later, it does nothing. Because it returns function. In the first line of main, we just don't even take this result, nothing happens. In the second line, if we do to the x, but again, nothing is printed. Nothing was really done, only the, so the, Function itself, this, this say it later, is a lazy function. It returns other function. It doesn't do any harm. It only gives you a function that you can actually do some, some nasty stuff. You can do side effect. Yeah, so this, the result of this is impure. But the function itself is pure. And that's the trick. So if we go back to our original problem, we can rewrite it. This will be complex, and I will use a special structure. Oh, I've written pancake, so it's naleśnik in Polish, and I do recommend them. If someone is from, not Pol from Poland here, I do recommend to try naleśniki, so pancakes. And we create this, file, this, 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 this kind of object. So this is, this is having, if you don't know Kotlin, I have just one field inside this action that takes no argument and returns A. So this is very generic and has map, flat map. I don't have time to talk all about it, but if you have some uh, experience with optional or some lists, you know what flap map and map is. And there is this nasty function unsafe run, 
which is impure, should be used with caution. Well, basically, the idea is you never use it. It's the same like with optional. You have optional in Java. The rule you have to learn in order to be efficient with that to never actually call get on that. Or the same with futures and uh, stuff like that. You should try to not actually get the value. You, try, you should try to map maybe finally at the end. Uh, but then you should mostly try to use map and flat map. So if you rewrite this code that we had, that our impure method do not do this impure code, but put it inside Naleśnik, so our special structure, which actually is a just a la covers lazily the real action, we have some nice features of this code, because now we still have the same bug. We had to rewrite code to actually now use flat map in order for it to compile. It is actually a very easy step. And now, even though the code is buggy, we don't pay twice, because we actually deliver it only once. And it's because you see crash delivery actually returns Naleśnik, and it must be, so it's way, and obviously someone might say, oh, now we have the different type of errors, because sometimes we just don't do the real action. And it really happens if you are doing, for instance, reactive programming, okay, with something with observables, uh, reactors, whatever, this is a common mistake. The real action wasn't called. There was no subscribe. The point is, it's way easier to spot that because you see, obviously, there is no result. So even during the simplest test, you will see that there is a problem. It's at the cost and severity of that is less, is smaller than doing things repeatedly, doing side effects many times, formatting disk three times like, like this. So delivering things twice. So and now, obviously, to the point, some of you might understand that well, why I used Naleśnik, because it's much better than Burrito. And Naleśnik is something which is basically known as IO Monad. And if you don't know IO Monad, if you worked with Reactor or similar project, it's more or less this. It's a mono. It's something that will be an object later. This is more complex, actually. So mono is more than IO monad, uh, but nevertheless, it's very similar in use. And if you ever, in Kotlin, we have some project called ArrowFX. And here is an, another uh, representation of what is IO. It's actually coroutine of this type. This is a very interesting approach, and I use it in one of the demos you would have code later, or you, uh, there was in a link at the beginning. OK? So uh, to frameworks. Actually, so I was writing this kind of a Kotlin code in the past in many projects, and the bad part of that, frameworks were not helping me. I wanted to be pure. What I had to do? I had to write my own transaction monad a few times. But this is very simple, uh, simple transaction monad. It's not really covering all the potential problems, like uh, timeouts, whatever. But it's not that much code to write to make it very actually mm, robust and useful on the production. And then you can use transaction monad, exactly like this kind of monad, when you cover data by transaction, um, which are basically impure, especially if you mutate inside of this. And Safely, you, then you can safely compose these size effects with math and flat map. Why? Because it's safer, it's easier to spot the bugs. And by the way, even easier to debug. Uh, there is a generic approach that actually, instead of IO monad of A, as a result, we, we can represent it more generically. It's IO that takes some environment, like, by the way, here was actually exactly that, uh, because if we do something on, on, a pro, on a database, let's say our environment is some connection to this database. So we can make it more generic. It's, there is always some connection to some resources from the real world. And then we either return a result or return error state. Not We don't throw exception. We return error state. OK, and who has heard about Scala Zio? Who used Scala Zio? Oh, so basically, this is now very popular in Scala thanks to this great project. And they do uh, this really approach as business code uh, with Zio. Uh, and Actually, a few years ago, I started my own project where I didn't know what to do for many, for many months. Then I seen Zio, and I more or less uh, adapted this project to be Zio-like. But my goal was basically, and this is a new project, would you see? It's my research project. I don't really recommend using it on a production, but it's a, it's a great thing if you want to learn pure functional uh, programming, and you want to be just better, and you want to experiment with that. But the idea was to make if someone has experience with Spring and one likes this kind of programming, make it easy to actually do Spring in a safe way, safe way without Kalaspa scanning, runtime aspects, and all that stuff. Make it on the compiler level. 
So instead of writing code like that, by the way, who is sure that this is, a, let's say, springy code? Who is so sure that caching happens after security check? Who knows that? Who is sure about it? That will not change in the new version of Spring, I don't know, or, or in a recent version of Spring? Because that would be really bad if one admin is, watching, is calling this function, and it's cached for admin, and then every user can use the cached version because security check has, happens after cache. That would be really bad, yeah? And the funny thing, <laughs> I've seen code like that. <laughs> Developers were answering typically, well, it's, it's obviously correct. Spring people wouldn't be that stupid, and they are not. So they made it correctly, but if you want to be sure, it takes a lot of time to actually check that. With the documentation, actually, you have to go to the code. OK. So actually, you can rewrite this in a, using compiler and functional programming in this way. And this code will work more or less the same, but instead, it will not use any class path extension, dynamic proxies, whatever. It's just simple call, calls of functions and monads that you have inside. So uh, frameworks that help me. Kotlin Tor. Who has used Kotlin Tor? So this is basically a great uh, web framework for Kotlin, which I like, which it helps me to write code in a functional style. And in a, co in a code examples that I provide later, or were on this barcode, actually you would see how to use that safely, fun functionally, all the way. There is this generic functional programming theory category in, uh, in, in Kotlin, but I only use that as uh, for, uh, let's say, experiences and hobby projects, ROFX, ROKT. There is this KIO project where basically never used that, but someone tried to copy basics of ZO to Kotlin. But if you are interested, look at it, because it's an it's, it's interesting experience to use that. And then this is my knee experimental. I would say this is a showcase. I like it. If you want to help me with this project, I'm glad uh, to get any help, because it's a showcase that you can have almost as easy, springy-like programming, but in a, done in a safe way. OK. Now the point is, you know, let's for a moment think that you know now how to write uh, functional programming, but how can you enforce this? That people, for instance, don't mutate. So do you have a purity ring? I have. OK, this is not really working well. But nevertheless, what about self-discipline? I'm talking about coding. So, so you have to be disciplined. Huh? You have to be careful. You have to review all the re lines of code your colleagues are writing. This doesn't work. You know why? Because there is always this nasty point, demo. One hour before demo, no rules. <laughs> there are no rules that cannot be broken. The problem is, if you put this code, variable, just hour because we want to present demo, then the task is marked done, and it stays there forever. And now you have impure code, and all this nasty compo uh, no nice composability doesn't work anymore. Ooh. But there are tools that can help you. So. I created, uh, I started actually this, this thing. Pure Kotlin is like, yeah, uh, uh, misspelled pure Kotlin. And what is this? Has, has any one of you used Detect for Kotlin? Yeah, this is a great project. So basically, linter for Kotlin. I do rec if, you, if you do Kotlin seriously in a team, always use det the Detect. It's basically the same as a check style or a similar projects in Java. Checks you for bugs, checks your formatting. You can put your rules. That's a great for teamwork. But the great thing about Detect, it, it allows you to write your own plugins. So Cure Potlin is actually a plugin where you can, for instance, say, I do not allow variables. I do not allow returns. I do not allow for while statements, because they are obviously, uh, they actually force you to use variables. So, they are, you are not allowed to even use unit void. So one of the guys added it because it's, he said this is a crucial for a, uh, Android programming. I cannot confirm that because I'm not doing Android programming with Kotlin. I'm doing web programming. But this is also useful thing. Because basically, returning unit means you are doing nothing. Or you are doing side effect. But if you do side effects, then you shouldn't return unit. You should retain a monad. OK? So there are basically all other stuff. Some, some of them are really crazy. Uh, you don't have to go all the way. Some of them are even uh, by default disabled. The point is, you can enable some of them. You can enable one of them. And even greater, because Detect is a cool tool. You have thousands of classes. Well, you typically don't have that many in Kotlin yet. It's not that old a language, but you have hundreds. And all of them are nasty. 
and you say, I don't want to use vars anymore. Now you have a problem. Hundreds of errors and projects will not compile. No, that text allows you to say, this is my baseline. It will scan your code and say, and generate some XML, which will basically say, this is all known problem, and we'll leave it as like that. We just don't use any more of this stuff. Like, we don't use any, any var in the new code, but we allow what was in the past. That's basically great thing for every uh, linter that you have in order to enable it in a legacy project, to, to ability to leave your past behind. Yeah. So basically, pure code means a lot of no's. We don't use variables, no loops, no instructions, no voids, no returns, no throw. And there is no mercy. Yeah? Uh, with the small exceptions, at the end, in the main, we are allowed to do once this call. And basically, there is a proof, actually, because functional programming is a Turing complete thing. It can, all the programs that you write can be done in a functional pure way. And by the way, I'm doing that for years. So I can show pro projects that are really doing uh, even are connected, for instance, for physical print, uh, uh, printing systems, like th that print uh, hundreds of, PD, uh, of mails that are actually delivered to customers. And the code itself is pure. This can be written like that. So now one other question, do you even need FP? I am, if maybe you are lucky, you never have bugs on production or they are not severe, maybe you don't need that. And yes, there are a lot of projects, projects that don't need that. But one sooner or later, we'll get to this more complex project in a team that actually you see, hmm, having less errors, this is a good thing. But I have an analogy. There is, that's Abacus. Sorry for a small picture. So people were using this tool to help in arithmetics like in ancient times. And you, if you use Abacus, now it's kind of strange, but it was a useful tool. And if we were, if we were adding simple things, like, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, was, that was enough. And then, Hundreds actually of years ago, people were, were starting to think about can we do it better? And we're inventing mechanical calculators. And I'm sure that some of the people using Abacus were looking at this and were saying, ah, oh, those are cumbersome, those are so heavy. I don't need that. Why would I even need that? Yes? Because if you do simple arithmetic, it's not really that useful. But if you do the, uh, multiplications, actually, way, way uh, easier to use that tool. Yeah? So, but the point is, but the point is, we can make another step. And like, actually, in the last century, people slowly were switching that to electrical first and then electromechanical uh, calculators, which were heavy. And you need electricity. So obviously, they are less useful. And there were obviously people saying that, oh, if I have mechanical calculator, why would I use this heavy electromechanical machine, which needs a lot of power and costs. Uh, but now you can have divisions. So, so the point is that some people need more complex stuff, and then those people that were using just mechanical uh, devices looked, OK, actually, now I see way more complex arithmetics I, can, I was not even thinking of making, of using, if I have this tool. So they became popular. And then we had computers, like this is Univac. And uh, there was this famous statement. One, one moment, I, I think that was IBM CEO, said that the world needs maximum 50 computers, the whole world. There is no need for them, because only that many organizations need really a complex arithmetics. Because initially, computers were like just fancy calculators, let's say. Yeah. The, the point is, once you see what it can do, you, what it can do, you see that you can, oh, we are actually victims of that. We have them now all everywhere. Yeah, but the point, my, my point here, if you are a guy with abacus, it fits your needs, but you don't even see what you can do, <laughs> with, what, what you can do with a computer. You can't imagine because you have to do small steps. That's why I presented this all with steps because first step, for instance, is very easy, immutability. You will see very quickly the result. How, that you have less bugs. And then the next steps, you, once you are there, you will see that it makes sense to use expressions. Actually, though, other steps, you don't have to follow this road exactly. You, you, basically, immutability is the first step, but the other steps are, you can take in a different order. Definitely, monads are at the end. And by the way, this is not the, close. This is not the full road. There are deeper stuff there. But we are talking about Kotlin and simple stuff, so it's not yet. So project links. 
So you can see these things actually working with a code. There's even an online demo uh, at the end of a, something like to the list. So th those are, let's say, projects that I could publish. Huh? So sorry for that, another to do list, but I couldn't publish typically <laughs> my work projects. I am just not allowed to, mostly. OK. So uh, this is link for that. And my summary. So I am doing, actually, I started functional programming in the 90s, last century. Uh, I was first exposed to the uh, language called SML uh, while I was still a student. And I still remember this moment when, for initially, that was just a toy. I was playing with that with my colleagues. And then well, that was this moment when we realized, you know, it's a little bit harder to write programs. But once they compile, they always will do exactly what I want. That was a huge change. We've we seen that. At that time, I was a C++ developer, but I remember this completely changed the way I wrote code in C++. I started to do functional coding in C++. It's actually, in some ways, it's, it's better than in Java. In some ways, it's actually harder. For instance, you, you need some garbage collection, which actually you can have in C++. But nevertheless, this was a cool change. And since then, I was doing Java, not really functionally. I was trying, but for many years, it was tedious, not that funny. Uh, then came lambdas, and that was really uh, when, when life became great. I, I think the Java made the best step with lambdas. It's shown that functional programming is actually cool to many people. And then there was a Scala. Uh, OK, it was actually before Java 8, but nevertheless, it was like, uh, I would say some people call it gateway drag, yeah? To enable functional programming to the world. Yeah. So basically, my, my statement is the more, more complex programs you write, the more help from FPUC. So you pay this price for writing a little bit more complex code. Looks so, you have to write, you have constraints, but then you have programs that do not break on production, because if something breaks, it breaks during the compilation. Obviously, it's not a silver bullet. Obviously, there are a lot of codes that maybe you do some UI, and you can actually, well, nothing wrong happens if the button doesn't work. It's a, I will see that. That's not working, so I will fix that easily. But for instance, I will, nothing like uh, mm, deleting the database will happen. Yeah? The road to FP is kind of a long way, especially for a team because you have to slowly introduce steps, but it really pays off. And you, you see with each step some, some profit. And with like tools like Pure Kotlin on some discipline, you can see you can make it in small steps. Yeah? And at the end, Kotlin is obviously not Scala. For me, kind of is. I just, I'm, in my heart, I'm more Scala developer than Kotlin. But uh, that was this point, like a couple of years ago, in a team I wanted to enforce Scala. I didn't want to do Java anymore. Uh, but my colleagues were just you know, saying, oh, I don't like Scala. This community is crazy. And then we met in the middle with Kotlin. And actually, that was a really good decision. I think they are satisfied, and I was satisfied. Because yeah, they, they could write initially Java++. I could write initially Scala minus minus, And we just met in the middle. middle. OK. And that's, that's the end. Oh, I'm just at the time. I don't, I don't have, if you have any questions, you can ask. There are, are there any questions? Nope, nope, nope. OK, but I'm, I'll be there. You feel free to ask me about my, my company as well uh, that I work for, about this code. You can look at this. Be happy. Uh, have a fun conference. Have fun with functional programming. OK, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>